Um, this is an artist's reconstruction of uh, what I woke up to after coming out of surgery on February 13th of this year, um, after a mutant strain of flesh-eating bacteria uh, liquefied a good chunk of my leg. These are uh, egg cones. This picture does not actually convey the, the true depth of the experience. Uh, for one thing, I woke up embedded in gelatin, so I could not move. And for another thing, everybody in the OR was screaming at each other at the tops of their lungs. It does, however, um, convey a sense of the, the overall lameness of the experience. Uh, I had a friend, actually a Native American, uh, an Iroquois, who uh, was going under the knife for a different uh, reason at about the same time. When she woke up, she saw a grizzly bear wandering around the, uh, the recovery room. So she got this massive charismatic super predator, which, which I, as a biologist, think I really should have got. Um, and I get egg cartons lining the roof of the, lining the, roof of the operating theater. Uh, but though they were lame, uh, they were also quite real. And I want to emphasize that. Those egg cartons were as real to me uh, in that moment as you guys all are to me in this one. In fact, there are, are some hallucinations, near-death experiences, uh, Kluber conscious things, that are actually, literally, realer than real because they are entirely internal. They don't have to pass through the low-resolution bottleneck of real eyes and real ears. And as a result, they seem more lucid than life. Uh, and in fact, uh, the fact that they are more real than real is, is how we know, ironically, that they are not. And it's still not running. Why is that not running? Come on, damn it. after I had uh, forgotten to change the bandages for a couple of weeks and it had turned gangrenous. Um, in hindsight, I probably should have posted a not safe for work notice on the blog. Um, almost immediately, I started getting comments saying that people were losing their lunches. Uh, I got a number of other comments basically urging me to get down to emergency and have it checked out stat. Uh, this all happened despite the fact that, that this particular picture, let's hope this changes properly, was somewhat different from other pictures of the same injury uh, that I had posted previously. <clears throat> and in fact, some of these expressions of concern and revulsion uh, also continued even after certain people had posted in the comments that they had noticed what appeared to be bits of finely chopped onion and red bell <laughs> pepper at the site of the injury. Uh, in fact, it was, it was not so much a picture of <laughs> the hole in my leg, but it was the picture, it was a close-up of a pastry shop from the Netherlands that somebody had sent me. And, you know, quite apart from being, you know, causing somebody to lose their lunch, this actually was somebody's lunch. <laughs> and I actually found it really fascinating that exactly the same image would be either appetizing or nauseating, depending entirely on context. Now, this is different from the drug-induced hallucination I let off with. That was the brain manufacturing images out of whole cloth. Uh, in contrast, this is the brain repurposing an extant image. It doesn't change one pixel of what it actually sees, but it interprets the meaning of what it sees entirely different simply on the basis of its, um, of its expectation. The technical term for this is, uh, um, I believe, selective, uh, selective perception. is going on with this thing. Okay. This is a famous video from the Cognition Lab, University of Illinois. It's 12 years old. It's uh, got over 4 million hits on YouTube, so I'm not going to try and uh, game you with it. Suffice to say that under controlled circumstances, almost two-thirds of the people viewing this footage did not notice the gorilla <laughs> walking across uh, center stage and pounding his chest. And they saw it. Uh, technically, uh, obviously the, limit, the, the image hit their retinas. But somewhere between the back of the eyeball and the conscious brain, the brain just decided that the gorilla didn't exist and edited it out of the picture. Now, 
Our brains pull this kind of shit all the time. Uh, you all know about the blind spot in the middle of your visual field. It's a, a big hole in the retina where the photoreceptor cables punch through the back of the eyeball. And uh, it's right there in front of you, a big honking hole that you can. And it's not just that you can't see what's in the hole. You cannot see the hole itself. Um, by rights, we should have this big fuzzy blotch hanging in front of us 24-7. We don't. And the reason we don't uh, is because the eyes are constantly jiggling around in their sockets. And so what happens is the brain can overlay different frames, essentially. The blind spot, because the eye is jiggling, the blind spot is constantly moving around the, the visual landscape. And so the brain can overlay subsequent frames, and it can fill in a hole in one frame with imagery from the other. Now the, the uh, implication here is that we don't see reality as a continuous stream, but rather as a series of still snapshots um, stitched together further upstream. And that's not metaphor, that is, is literal truth. Because the visual system is not capable of handling the motion blur that occurs during the jiggle. And it deals with this by shutting off the visual system completely, three, four times a second. And then further upstream, the brain stitches these, these freeze frames together into uh, an illusion of continuous motion. So just to summarize, your brain handles a blind spot by making you completely blind three to four times a second and you never even notice. Uh, basically, the bandwidth of consciousness is so low or so small that some calculations uh, figure that it was 20 to 30 bits per second that consciousness simply can't handle even a fraction of the raw sensory input coming into our cables. So the brain triages, basically. It decides what gets through and what doesn't. And because the visual system is so glitchy to begin with, these filters tend to regard really weird, absurd input as errors, rather than something that is real but unprecedented. And it simply, you know, edits them out of existence. These unlikely things never make it into our perceptual sphere. So the brain edits out the gaps. It edits out the invisible gorillas in our midst. Uh, it edits out the skyscrapers that pop in and out of existence directly in front of you to cite another uh, study from these guys in the Cognition Lab in Illinois. Uh, Douglas Adams called this the somebody else's problem field <laughs> in, his, uh, in his Hitchhiker saga, in which you could actually create an effective cloaking device just by making something so weird-ass absurd that nobody would believe in it. And it's also been cited explicitly in episodes of Doctor Who to explain why people in 21st century London seem so amazingly incurious and ignorant of the fact that this weird anachronistic police box keeps appearing on street corners. And it's a really cute science that you can see. But it, it also more than that. And you may be justifiably skeptical that something so crude and in your face could actually work in real life. But really, you cannot argue with invisible gorillas. So moving from our perception of reality to the actual nature of reality, um, you have all run into the premise that reality is an illusion. Matrix managed to um, popularize that particular hypothesis, even gave it a bit of street cred until uh, the crappiness of the subsequent movies made it obvious that the first movie was just basically beginner's luck. <laughs> <laughs> there have also been a few actual papers written to the effect uh, that if matrix-type simulations are possible, the chances are overwhelming that we are living in one right now. The theory is officially called the simulation argument. It's front fronted primarily by an Oxford a philosopher named Nick Bostrom. And the logic is actually pretty simple. If it is, in fact, possible for us to create a simulated world that's good enough to fake out the simulated inhabitants there, and then by definition, um, all those simulated worlds are going to contain people that are capable of creating simulations of theirs in turn, and so on, so on, turtles all the way down. And if this is in fact the case, then you've got one meat space reality and a whole shitload of virtual ones. And basic probability dictates that the odds of us being in this one out of all these hundreds, thousands, however many they are, are really pretty low. <laughs> the other alternative, of course, is that such models cannot or will not be ever built, in, in which case the problem goes away. Now, the matrix never built, dealt with this whole recursive model within model uh, aspect. It was addressed in another film called The 13th Floor. This is a publicity still from that. Um, which had the incredibly bad luck of being released about two months after The Matrix came out. And this model might actually explain certain facets of the universe as we observe it. Uh, Planck length, for example. Um, 
Planck time. These are space-time dimensions down to the subatomic level, below which, according to traditional models, uh, reality just stops. Um, there's at least a passing similarity here to a pixel dimension, if you ask me. Some minimal level of resolution beyond which, or below which, the computer runs out of processing power, or the modeler just isn't interested in, in dealing with. Uh, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, uh, which you can bumper sticker down to the claim that uh, nothing exists unless it's observed, is also a little less counterintuitive in, in light of a modeling hypothesis. But the, uh, the simulation argument is actually pretty tame uh, compared to some others out there. All it suggests is that our particular world is a simulation model uh, embedded in a, a larger reality. A wilder theory is that the universe, reality itself, while solid enough in physical space, is actually a big honking computer. Um, in this particular model, matter is the hardware. The laws of physics are the operating system. And every slip of an electron state is essentially an act of computation. According to this model, all us cognizant beings, not to mention everything else in the place, are actually checksums and products of ongoing calculation. Now, this is not just undergraduate wankery. It is um, a fundamental premise of a burgeoning field called digital physics. And I've heard some pretty heavy hitters, amongst them uh, Lee Smolin, you may have heard of him, he's out at the Perimeter Institute, uh, discuss this model with a straight face. And of course, the obvious question is, if the universe is a computer, who built the damn thing? And why? And the obvious answer, at least the first part of the question, is, of course, God. Uh, God is the guy who built the hardware, God is the software geek who set the, the software running. Uh, God watches it from the outside, sees the little sparrow fall, uh, makes its hand felt in every subatomic subroutine, yada, yada, yada. The one problem with this, of course, is that computers compute, they solve problems. The very existence of a computer implies something not yet known, some problem yet unsolved. What possible use could an omniscient being have um, for a computer? Doesn't God already know everything? Well, maybe not according to this model. According to this model, maybe God's just a bored graduate student sitting on a lap trying to finish a thesis somewhere. Uh, but even if you adhere to the traditional paradigm of God as an all-knowing, all-powerful entity, the model still basically holds up. Because, uh, after all, even us mortals use a fair amount of CPU processing power on calculations for solutions that we already know the answer to, we're not particularly interested in. Uh, we're really more interested in the calculations themselves than the solution. And God could do the same thing, and I'm an omniscient being could run these kinds of calculations if, in fact, it wasn't so much trying to find an answer to something as it was entertaining itself. Uh, which is to say that, that God, like so many of those made in his image, would effectively be a porn addict. <laughs> um, and this is reasonably consistent with certain Old, uh, Old Testament um, visions of Yahweh, which charitably describe God as kind of a snuff fetishist to uh, various forms of bondage, sexual slavery, and so on. Uh, I should say, just for the record, I'm not actually sure whether or not God as a porn addict is an official part of the digital physics canon. Uh, it does seem to me like a kind of a, a reasonable extension of the premise, but certainly the Wikipedia article I read on it didn't say anything along those lines. Anyhow, the weirdness continues. It has also been proposed that the universe is a giant hologram or more specifically, a two-dimensional information structure painted on the cosmological horizon, such as the three dimensions we observe are only an effective description of macroscopic scales and low energies. I'm uh, not really sure what that means. I think it has something to do with the idea of a hologram as a three-dimensional object encoded on a two-dimensional surface. So if you can think of the cosmological horizon, the edge of the universe, as the surface of a soap bubble, all the structure and stuff that we and the information that we perceive inside that soap bubble are merely projections from that surface layer. That's my, my vague understanding of it, at least. Um, and that was bringing tears to the eyes of anybody who actually knows what I think I'm talking about. Um, in the end, though, none of this matters. <coughs> because whatever is out there, 
uh, whether it's matrix or mean space, we're not seeing it any more than we're seeing our own blind spots. Uh, ultimately, we have no way of parsing reality except through our senses. Uh, our, ultimately, we have no way of parsing what our senses tell us except through our, our brains. And what I'm hoping to show you this morning, what I hope I've already started to show you with all these pictures of meat pies and invisible gorillas, is that our senses just aren't up to the task and our brains are pathological liars. That the take home message today basically is that survival is incompatible with any kind of perception of objective truth. <laughs> now, if you were at last year's talks, you may remember that I kind of brought up this idea in the context of religious belief and authoritarianism. The idea that brains are survival engines, not truth detectors, and that if believing a lie will increase your fitness, uh, then the brain will relieve that lie with all its furry little heart. And I brought that up as a way to introduce our belief in things we can't see, as, as precursors to religious belief. And this year, I'm going to step back a couple of, of steps and, and take a look at a larger canvas. I'm going to ask you not only to reject the things that you can't see, but the things that you can as well. Uh, I'm going to argue that transcendence equals suicide. So if you want to get a good grasp on what's really up there, you're probably going to have to die for the privilege. I'm going to argue that though we probably won't ever be able to parse reality as it exists, we might be able to come a little closer if we're willing to inflict certain types of brain damage on ourselves. And I am going to suggest that pedophiles will probably be the ones to lay the ground rules for the upcoming singularity. However, I suspect most of you probably aren't ready for that yet. <laughs> so we're going to go back to do some basic groundwork. Now, everybody gets this. This is standard Newtonian physics. You can write it mathematically if you want to, Newton did. Um, but you don't have to because you get it in your gut. You feel an appreciation for this. So does every dog who ever caught a frisbee. And the reason for this is that we evolved up on a scale where classical physics matter. Uh, people fall off cliffs up here. Uh, people get hit in the head with rocks. Somebody chucks a spear at you. The trajectory of that object in space and time is going to have a significant impact on your future reproductive fitness. <laughs> so there has always been intense natural selection for a deep appreciation of classical physics. But classical physics has a substructure, and we don't get that at all. We've got the math that drags us kicking and screaming towards conclusions that are absolutely batshit insane. We have done the experiments. We have based massive technologies on quantum physics, nothing from GPS to laser beams to woodwork if we had it wrong. And yet, nobody knows what it actually means. Either nothing exists until something observes it, or billions of universes are boiling into um, existence from nothing every nanosecond. Either nothing is real or everything is. Effect can precede cause. Objects can be in many different places at the same time. Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead at the same time. This is not a theory. This is not a model. This is basically just a bunch of correlations. Um, they're mathematically described, they're painstakingly derived, but they are a black box for all of that. Uh, we know the equations work because every time you feed in A, you get B and C out the other end, but we have no idea why. <laughs> uh, Niels Bohr famously once said, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, then you haven't understood it yet. Nobody understands it. But then again, you know, why, why should we? We did not evolve in the space between atoms. Uh, we evolved up here on the classical savanna, you know, and, and uh, things like subatomic, things that happen in the subatomic realm, quantum effects, they're simply irrelevant. Um, this stuff down here, the, the baseline level of reality, that's, that's got nothing to do with survival or, or fitness. That's, that's just truth. That's just reality. No wonder we don't get it. So, there are aspects of reality that our sens senses simply aren't built for. And there are sensory glitches that screw with our perception, even of the things we are built for. <clears throat> and you might think we can use our brains to correct for this. You might think that's what we're doing right now. We're having this pleasant little discussion, using our brains to recognize the errors and correct for them. <clears throat> Except the cognitive parts of our brain are just as unreliable as the, perpetual, as the perceptual parts. We are using the wrong machine to check for errors, in other words. We're trying to use a dishwasher to vacuum the carpet. <laughs> it's not just our senses. Our very thought process has been compromised. Case in point, mother love. 
I wrote a blog point of posting a few years back in which I suggested that the mothers or the parents of new children, new baby, newborn children, should not be allowed to vote on grounds of reduced mental capacity. <laughs> and you probably know my reasoning because you probably all encountered glassy-eyed parents who can't stop talking about their damn kids, who insist that you'll never know what true love is until you've laid eyes on your baby or held them in your heart. And these people just know in their hearts that the rest of us live for, for no other reason than to see pictures of their little darlings plastered all over Facebook every time we log in. You have either encountered these people or you have seen these people. <laughs> but there is a reason why politicians are so fond of crying out, why won't someone think of the children whenever any discussion verges too close towards rationality? Because the invocation of children stops short circuits the upper brain functions entirely, puts the brain stem in control. It's why we use babies to sell radial tires. It's why we seem to reserve our most visceral disgust and hatred to child abusers. And it's, it's easy to see why. I mean, imagine two mothers of newborn children. And one just knows in her deepest heart that her, her baby's going to grow up to be a famous athlete and a scientist. And the other recognizes that she's just added one more greedy mouth to a planet that's already drowning under the weight of seven billion others just like it, and that in all um, likelihood, this particular mouth is just going to grow up and spend its life snarfing pork rinds and watching American fucking idol until the ceiling crashes in. <laughs> Which of these mothers has a more accurate view of reality? Which of them is more likely to be reproductively successful? This is a perfect example of fitness through delusion. Here's a list of some other common delusions. Uh, they generally fall under the heading of what Stephen Colbert has dubbed truthiness. You know these things are true in your gut. You just feel it. You want them to be true. Even if they contradict all known facts, you don't really care, for example. You test positive for a rare fatal disease uh, with a test that has an 80% accuracy rate. You figure you've got an 80% chance of being sick, right? No. Your chances of being sick are actually closer to one in a million even with a positive test result. Or facial recognition software that's 99% accurate flags a known terrorist crossing the street. 99% chance that he's your guy, right? The fact is, your, your actual chances of having the right guy are closer to 1% because of all the false positives that uh, are gonna show up in any city with more than 100,000 people. These are examples of brain rate, which is called uh, base rate neglect. And uh, it basically arises from our brain's inability to distinguish intuitively between something called type 1 and type 2 errors. Say you realize you've sunk time and effort into a really bad venture. If you had a do-over, you'd never get involved with it. But now that you're in it, you keep on investing because you don't want to waste the time and effort you've already spent. In fact, that is not a rational argument. That is an example of something called the Concord fallacy. And Facebook games like Farmville are explicitly designed to exploit that particular glitch. <laughs> the, the inventors of Facebook are on record as admitting that because that's how they designed it. Someone gives you a choice between getting $5 today or $10 the day after tomorrow. Half seconds thought makes it obvious that waiting a day or two doubles your payoff. And yet, most of us still choose the immediate payoff over the delayed one. That's called hyperbolic discounting. Oh yeah, there it is over there. And it arises because our brains are not very good at dealing with time. <clears throat> and here's something you probably don't even regard as a glitch, metaphors. We have been thinking symbolically as a species for 50, 60,000 years, give or take. So you would think that by now we would have a handle on the abstract concepts that we ourselves invented. Unfortunately, we thought exclusively in terms of basic literal sensory input for millions of years before that. So we are still maddeningly hardwired for literal mindedness. We think we understand what metaphors are. We think we're being all abstract when we talk about having a broken heart. But in fact, the part of your brain that lights up when you've been dumped is exactly the same part of your brain that lights up when your arm has been broken, when you suffer some other physical injury. You think that when you describe somebody as a warm personality, that you are talking about their outgoingness, their, their level of friendliness, that you are not talking about their thermal profile. We all know this, it's a metaphor. So how come 
you are more likely to think of somebody as a warm personality if you happen to be holding a cup of coffee the first time you meet them? Why are you more likely to regard them as a cold fish if you happen to be holding a slushie? It's because after 50 millennia or so, the brain still hasn't figured out that a cigar is not just a cigar, that sometimes it can symbolize other things. It mixes up signals. It feels physical heat and literally mistakes physical heat for the sense of an outgoing personality. And you'll know this dude um, washing his hands after turning Christ over to the Pharisees. This is another metaphor. It is another literal truth. Because a paper that came out, I think, last year in Science reports that washing your hands actually reduces anxiety and second guessing in the wake of making a tough decision. Say you decided to do take your vacation in Beirut this year instead of the Caribbean. Say you're wondering if that was actually a good call. You can literally wash that doubt away physically and end up more copacetic with the decision you've already committed to. As is good news for Pontius Pilate, it's good news for leading with Beth. It is not such good news for anybody in need of good Samaritans. Because once you've washed your hands, you are not only less likely to question past decisions, you are also less likely to help out others in need. Because you've washed away your sins already. You see, you're pure. You have nothing left to atone for, so why bother? Now, this effect is, is not limited to the religious or to the literary. It's common, as far as I know, to brains any brain that is aware of the metaphor on one level, but doesn't really know what a metaphor is on the other, and so literally confuses soap and water with moral absolution. Uh, some glitches are just side effects of a Pleistocene brain shoved into novel situations without uh, time to, to catch up and rewire. Metaphors are an example of that. Other glitches actually were adaptive, uh, actually didn't serve an adaptive purpose back in the day. Sometimes they still do. Uh, sometimes glitches are fairly harmless. These delusions are harmless. Something called post-purchase rationalization, for example. All that really does is it allows you to live with yourself. Uh, after you've blown good money on a really crappy David Bowie album uh, from his Berlin period. It, it, it lets you say to yourself, you know, this is actually a pretty good album. You just have to listen to it a few hundred times first. <laughs> Other glitches have world-altering ramifications. You see one oil-soaked bird, one quashy orca kid, and your heart goes out. You see 20,000, and your heart goes out pretty much the same as it did for one. Uh, not much more. The term is scoping sensitivity. And it arises from the brain's inability to internalize large numbers. As Spock points out here, a global tragedy barely matters more to you than a personal one. It's why a 1995 study on the Journal of Economics and Management found that the level of concern over risk to human health did not change significantly, even as the number of human lives in danger increased by an order of magnitude. But whether they are uh, adaptive or random, whether they are harmless or planet-stopping, they all impair our ability to see the world as it is. Uh, they make us all delusional, both in terms of raw input and cognitive processing. I read a paper recently uh, that says that even the skills that I'm using now, the, these are tools of reason to debate, do not exist to guide us towards truth, but merely they evolved to win arguments. For, they, allowed to, they allowed us to, to sway others and to try to get people to do what you want them to do. So we are not engaged in constructive truth-seeking here, in evolutionary terms. I'm just trying to make you all my bitches. <laughs> Stupid. Ah. Well, well. Okay. And perhaps the most profound delusion that we experience is the delusion that we have any control at all over our actions, the idea that we have free will. Now, I'm not talking about the utility of consciousness here. Uh, I have been there, I've done that, I have written a novel. I am perfectly willing to accept that most of our complex decision-making occurs at the unconscious level. I am not threatened by all those studies that show that your brain and your body are already acting on a decision 10 seconds before you're consciously aware of having made that decision. That only threatens your self-esteem if you regard yourself just as the little homunculus behind the eyes, the little uh, self-aware 
subroutine uh, floating on top of the system. If you're willing to regard yourself as the entire brain, conscious and non-conscious processes working together, this does not th threaten your notion of free will at all. All this really says is that one part of you made the decision before informing the other part. Now what really threatens the concept of free will is simple, basic physics. This is a neuron. Uh, your brain contains maybe 90 to 100 billion of these little guys. Um, and they are, as you all know, the computational unit of what we are. You cannot have a thought, you cannot experience a sensation, you cannot blink or breathe or do a single goddamn thing unless a bunch of these guys are firing. Now here's the thing. They never fire by themselves. It's physiologically impossible. They only fire in response to electrochemical signals coming in through these dendrites here. And if the sum total of those signals exceeds some critical threshold called the action potential, this neuron will in turn fire and send its signal down the axon. But, but the point is neurons are purely reactive, which means that your brain is purely reactive. It does not do anything unless it's stimulated to do so. Now, of course, there's lots of internal crosstalk. There are lots of feedback loops. Functional clusters fire in one part of the brain, kickstart clusters in another round and round it goes. Uh, but, but, but ultimately, the initiating signal has to come from somewhere. All these little meaty logic aids do not just fire themselves. They only fire, the impetus has to come from outside. So we do not act in a very real sense. We only react. And I'm having, ah, real problems. Come on. Now, if anybody can find a um, room for free will in a deterministic system like this, I hope they will come up to me after the talk and, and explain it to me, because I cannot see it. No matter how complex the internal circuitry of the brain, basic physics dictates that it cannot do anything except to react to external forces over which ultimately it has no control. Now, a few diehard free will types um, have, have jumped in with, with quantum physics at this point. They point out that quantum indeterminacy rules and, uh, underline all of uh, reality, and therefore, at least in principle, there is always the possibility of unpredictability. And that's true, so far as it goes. But a decision dictated by the role of the dice is actually no more free than one determined by deterministic or algorithm. It's just more random. We are not autonomous. We are automatic. We are automatons. And you reject this completely, of course. Uh, you know deep in your gut that we are free agents, that we make our own decisions, just as we know in our guts that there is no big honking hole in the middle of our visual field. The strength of whatever argument I make does not matter. In fact, uh, at least some of you, my, my very temerity in making these idiotic claims has led at least some of you to believe in free will even more than you did before. That's called the backfire effect. <laughs> Anybody still uh, keeping track? But the fact is your knowledge, your certainty, these are just words for different electricities and chemical bumping around in different racetracks in the brain. <clears throat> the fact is we actually don't know anything. You want to talk about myths? You live in one from cradle to grave. Our brains have reduced the entire universe down to a series of PowerPoint slides. They are nice to look at, they are easily digestible, but they are not very informative. And they are frequently downright misleading. We literally hallucinate reality. And these are only some of the biases that, that uh, we are aware of that we can see. There must be a bunch of others that we can't even imagine simply because our brains aren't hardwired uh, to even conceive of them in theory. You know how when you dream, all sorts of insane and absurd things seem perfectly normal. You accept them without question. And it's only when you wake up that you realize that mountain bikes cannot travel between the stars. And you are not dating a girl, a blonde, with, with one single hair the size of a tree trunk going out of the top of her head. Even though you completely accepted that that's who she was during the during course of the dream. Turns out we have a little logical gatekeeper in our temporal parietal cortex. And what it does is it basically filters out stuff that's too bad, shit crazy. It allows us to reject things that are just too absurd. But it goes offline when we sleep. 
So we basically accept everything that we see in dreams. We are completely non-skeptical. And it's a good thing we have that. But how do we know that we don't need another one in our waking state? How do we know that our waking experiences aren't every bit as absurd? It's the same brain, after all. It's exactly the same circuitry. It's the same chemicals. It's, they're processing the same kind of signals. Uh, maybe this environment is every bit as absurd as the other. It's just that we don't happen to have a temporal parietal sensor at this level. And your argument, your answer to all of this may be, um, well, so what? I mean, how else is a brain going to sense what's going on in the outer world without translating it into some kind of electrochemical shorthand? How else do you internalize the external? I mean, this, the model that we're looking at may not be true for capital T, but it obviously works well enough or we wouldn't be here talking about it. So what's my problem? Now my problem is that actually right now we do rather fancy ourselves to be seekers after truth with a capital T. Now we are interested in the space between atoms and the space between galaxies. We're interested in quarks and quasars and everything in between. Sure, we evolved to get laid and avoid predators and outcompete the competition, but we claim to have outgrown that. We are seekers after truth now. That's what science is all about. And then down here in the corner you've got the the uh, transhumanists and the singularitarians talking about how the uncoming singularity is going to change everything and how, how consciousness itself will never be the same. And of course the problem, as it always is, is that the very brains that are putting themselves on this truth-seeking pedestal are the same brains that have been refined and reshaped and refitted for billions of years to distort, subvert, and avoid the truth wherever they find it. So if we're really serious about this, we've got to change those brains. We have to rewire them, somehow physically mitigate the sensory and cognitive delusions that have come as standard equipment for so long. And while the state of the art won't be up to doing that neurosurgically for the next couple of decades, at least, I would think, in the meantime, there are some avenues we might want to explore, at least in terms of our sensory shortcomings. Uh, most of you have probably heard about uh, synesthesia and phantom limb syndrome. They're maladies that occur when sensory input gets crosswired in the brain. But this is the so-called Penfield homunculus. It's a, a picture of the brain's somatosensory cortex. Basically, this is a part of the brain that is represented by these little homunculi, which are distorted to represent the amount of processing power that the brain puts into um, parsing sensory input from various parts of the body. So the lower, the lower mouth, the cheeks, the tongue, the hands are huge because there's a lot of nerves in these parts and a lot of sensory signals coming in. Things like the, the butt or the elbow, not so much. Now when a body part gets amputated, say you lose your hand to a, an unfortunate bandsaw accident, the body part is gone. But all this hand parsing real estate is still sitting up there in the brain firing away. Sometimes cortical remapping occurs. So you get real estate from adjacent areas starting to sort of grow in to this particular spot here. Now the brain is still expecting to get hand data from here. So when it gets any signal from this part of the brain, put itself together. Um, it thinks hand. It feels the presence of a hand, even though what it could actually be feeling is an itch in the ear or, or something that makes you want to scratch your nose. Uh, when people lose their feet, foot amputees, they not only feel the presence of phantom feet, but they also frequently feel incredibly intense super orgasms centered in the feet, centered in the phantom feet. And once again, if you look at the Penfield homunculus, you'll see that the, the map for genital processing butts right up against the feet. And think about how much extra processing power that, that these genitals could have if they could just sort of go in there and squat on the, the foot territory. I rather suspect that this probably has something to do with the uh, relative prevalence of foot fetishes, even amongst the unmutilated in, in the population. Now, synesthesia is the same kind of thing. Uh, but while phantom limb involves mixing up uh, tactile input from different body parts, synesthesia involves cross-wiring of signals from completely different sensory modes. Uh, synesthetes literally hear colors, they taste sound, uh, they see music. Certain rare synesthetes also see time. They basically see days and, and months and years arrayed around them like a, a circular keyboard. 
condition isn't even all that uncommon. Chances are actually probably pretty good that somebody in this room is synesthetic, at least mildly. Our brains can be right in all sorts of ways, as you can see. And, and really, why not? It's not as though your taste buds run on diesel and your optic nerves run on, on gasohol. Uh, it's all the same signal. It's all the same chemicals and electricity. The only thing that determines whether you see a stimulus or hear it is the part of the brain that the signal ends up feeding into. Um, this is Helen Marshall's brain. Um, Helen, if you could like to stand up so everybody. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I originally wanted to, to show you a picture of a normal brain. <laughs> but Helen's was the only one that was available on, on short notice, and most of its eccentricities are uh, not visible at this scale of resolution anyway. Um, it's a pretty healthy brain. I really don't know what to make of that dark spot there. Um, it looks a bit ominous to me, but in any event, Helen's brain is probably better off uh, than this one, which I catch from an old 1981 um, paper out of science. This is the brain of a person with perfectly normal social and cognitive skills. And as you can see, most of it is, well, kind of missing. Um, and this is not the most extreme case out there. The same paper reports on an engineering student, um, IQ 126, honors graduate, turns out to have a layer of brain tissue only one to two millimeters thick. We're talking a paper thin layer of neurons around an empty skull full of cerebrospinal fluid. Now uh, the technical term for this is hydrocephaly. And obviously most of its victims are profoundly retarded, but some of them seem to grow up to become engineers and school teachers before they find out they should have been vegetables instead. Um, and we don't know how many because even these people were undiagnosed until they grew up and went to the doctor for some completely different malady. And the doctors just kind of stumbled over the fact that they had virtually no detectable brain. <laughs> now these folks obviously aren't using any of the, the brain's standard sensory wetware to he, hear and see and taste because their brains don't even have those structures. So the existentially terrifying take home message here is that neural nets are really adaptable. There's absolutely no reason other than developmental inertia, that we can't parse sensory input any way we damn well want. We can taste light, we can hear the smell of cat shit. And since our subjective perception of sensory input is completely arbitrary anyway, uh, since the signals coming in the auditory nerve are identical in kind to those coming in from the olfactory bulb, who is to say that tasting sound isn't every bit as reliable a means of assessing the world as hearing it? So in principle, at least, this kind of a brain damage, rewiring your sensory circuits, might offer a way to work around some of the cognitive blinkers that keep us from seeing the truth with a capital T. Now ultimately, of course, if you really want to transcend the limits of what Dar Darwinian selection has, has done to our brains, it won't be enough to eliminate bias from the inputs. We're also going to have to eliminate cognitive bias as well. We're going to have to cut away all those little adaptive delusions that have been keeping us going. And then maybe you will be able to uh, dance below the plane, make their look past the singularity without going stark raving mad. Of course, at that point, you probably won't be able to cross the street or wipe your own ass without help because, after all, these are pro survival circuits. But then again, everything's a trade off, and it's not really as though any of us are going to survive that long anyway without a global technological infrastructure holding us up at this point. I think a bigger downside to cutting away all those circuits is that it is tantamount to cutting away you. You will have turned yourself into something that's not only not human, but cognitively speaking, isn't even a mammal anymore. Capuchins feel empathy. Uh, chimpanzees have a sense of justice and fair play. You can look into the eyes of any cat and dog, and you can see a connection there. You can see a, a legacy of common subroutines and shared emotions. Transcendence would destroy that connection. It would turn the self into something that has never existed before. I'm told this is pretty close to what the Buddhists believe that true enlightenment is achieved only by giving up the sense of self, the illusion of the self, the illusion of conscious will, which is actually a pretty profound insight for a guy born into an agrarian society without any brain scanning technology. I don't know how the Buddha derived these insights. Uh, I kind of suspect psychoactive drugs may have been involved. <laughs> but it is not a bad hypothesis, given what we now know about the way the brain works, that in order to find true enlightenment, one must leave the self and its life behind. And I have to wonder if we're really up for that. Because we come with self-preservation instincts of standard equipment, and they've got about four billion years of reinforcement behind them. I don't think the conventional self wants to go anywhere. 
thank you very much. I mean, everybody wants to have Bill Gates' bank account. Nobody wants to be Bill Gates, um, much less some.